Peter Lilly. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you. It's a pleasure, as always, to follow the uh, right honourable gentleman, the member for uh, Oldham, who gave us a characteristically thoughtful and radical speech. I don't necessarily start from the same premises as him, but I, what he says, I think, was an important contribution to this debate, on the securing of which uh, I want to pay credit to my honourable friend, the member for Wickham. He's done the House a service, he's done the country a service by forcing us to focus on the issue of where money comes from uh, and uh, what banks do. And he did so uh, in a very insightful way. Uh, above all, I think he showed that he sees, as our un old universities used to see, economics as a branch of moral sciences. It's not just a, a narrow analytical economic issue, but a moral, a philosophical, ultimately a theological uh, issue, which he uh, illuminated well for the House. Uh, a lot has been made of the ignorance uh, of members of Parliament of uh, how money is created. And I suspect that uh, that ignorance, not just in members of Parliament, but in the intellectual elite in this country, uh, explains a lot of things, not least why we entered the uh, financial crisis with a regulatory system that was so unprepared for a banking crisis. Uh, I suspect it's because people had not reflected on why banks are so different from all other capitalist companies. And they're different in three crucial respects, which is why they need a very different sort of regulatory system from normal companies. First, bankers, not just rogue bankers, but all bankers, even the best, the most honourable and the most honest, do things which would land the rest of us in jail. Near my house in France uh, is a large grain silo. After the harvest, farmers deposit grain in it. The silo gives them a certificate for every tonne of grain that they deposit. Uh, they can withdraw that amount of grain whenever they want by presenting that certificate. If the silo owner issued more certificates than the grain he kept in his silo, he would go to jail. But that is effectively what bankers do. They keep as reserves only a fraction of the money deposited with them, which is why we call the system the fractional reserve banking system. Murray Rothbart, a much neglected uh, Austrian economist in this country, uh, therefore said very flatly, banking is fraud. Fractional reserve banking is fraud. It should be outlawed. Uh, banks should be required to keep 100% reserves against the money they lent out. Now, I actually reject that inclusion, conclusion because I think there is a value in what banks do in transforming short-term savings into long-term investments. And that is socially valuable, and that's the function banks serve. But we need to... Uh, recognise the second distinctive feature of banks, which arises directly from the fact uh, that they uh, only have a fraction of the reserves against the uh, loans they make. And that is that banks individually and collectively are intrinsically unstable. They're unstable because they borrow short and lend long. I've been constantly amazed throughout the financial crisis hearing intelligent people say that the problem with Northern Rock or RBS or HBOS or the German banks or the French, Swiss, uh, the Swiss, French, Greek and other banks which ran into problems was the result of them borrowing short and lending long and they shouldn't have been doing it. As if this was a deviation from their normal role. But of course banks borrow short and lend long. That is what banks do. That is what they're there for. If they hadn't done that, they wouldn't be banks. Banking works so long as uh, too many depositors don't with try to withdraw their funds simultaneously. But if depositors, retail or wholesale, withdraw or refuse to renew their short-term deposits, a bank will fail. Now, if normal companies fail, there's no need for the government to intervene. Their assets will be redeployed in a more profitable use 
or taken over by a better managed company. But if one bank fails, depositors are likely to withdraw deposits from other banks about which there may also be doubts. And a bank facing a run, whether or not initially justified, will be forced to call in loans or sell collateral, causing asset prices to fall, thereby undermining the solvency of other banks. So the failure of one bank may lead to the collapse of the whole banking system. The third distinctive feature of banks is that which was highlighted by my uh, honourable friend, that banks create money. The vast majority of money consists of bank deposits. If your bank lends your company uh, uh, 10 million pounds, it does not need to go and borrow that money from a saver. It simply creates an extra 10 million pounds by electronically crediting your bank account or the company's bank account with 10 million pounds. It creates 10 million pounds out of thin air. By contrast, when you repay an existing bank loan, that extinguishes money. It disappears into thin air. So the total money supply increases when banks create new loans faster than old loans are being repaid, and that's where growth in the money supply comes from normally. It's the normal situation in a growing economy. Ideally, credit should expand so that the supply of money grows sufficiently rapidly to finance the growth in economic activity. But when a bank or banks collapse, they will call in loans, which will reduce the money supply, which in turn will cause a contraction of activity throughout the economy. So in that respect, banks are totally different from other companies, even companies which also lend things. If a car rental company collapses, it doesn't lead to a reduction in the number of cars available in the economy. Its stock of cars can be sold off to other rental companies or to individuals. Nor does the collapse of one rental company weaken the position of other car rental companies. On the contrary, they then uh, face less competition, which should strengthen their margins. So the collapse of a car rental company has no systemic implications, whereas the collapse of a bank can pull down the whole banking system and plunge the economy into recession. That's why we need a, a special regulatory regime for banks and, above all, a lender of last resort to pump in money if there is a run on the banks or a credit crunch. Yet this was barely discussed when the new regulatory structure uh, of our financial and banking system was set up in 1998. The focus then was on consumer protection issues and systemic stability and the lender of last resort function were scarcely mentioned. That's why the UK was so unprepared when the credit crunch struck in 2007. Nor were these uh, aspects properly considered when the euro was set up. As a result, they established a currency and a banking system without giving the new central bank the powers to act as lender of last resort. It's had to usurp such powers more or less illegally. That's their problem. The analysis, uh, this analysis is not uh, one of those insights which come from hindsight. Uh, some while ago, uh, Michael, now the noble Lord Howard, reminded Parliament, and indeed me, <laughs> i completely forgotten that I was Shadow Chancellor when the bill that became the Bank of England Act 1998 was introduced. And he pointed out that I then warned the House that, and I quote, with the removal of banking control to the Financial Services Authority, it's difficult to see how the Bank of England remains, as it surely should, responsible for ensuring the liquidity of the banking system and preventing systemic collapse. And so it turned out. And I added, setting up the Financial Services Authority may cause regulators to take their eye off the ball, leaving spivs and crooks to have a field day. And so that turned out too. I could foresee that then, because the problem was not deregulation, but the regulatory confusion and proliferation introduced by the former Chancellor resulting from failure to focus on the inherent stability of the banking system and to provide for it. Now, this failure to focus on the fundamentals was not a peculiarly British thing. The EU made the same mistake in spades when setting up the euro, and at the very apogee of the world financial system, they deluded themselves that instability was a thing of the past. 
In its Global Financial Stability Report in April 2006, just less than 18 months before the crisis erupted, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund no less, said, and I quote, there's growing recognition that the dispersion of credit risk by banks to a broader and more diverse group of investors, rather than warehousing such risk on their balance sheets, has helped make the banking and overall financial system more resilient. The improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. Consequently, the commercial banks may be less vulnerable today to credit or economic shocks. The supreme irony is that the pinnacle of the world regulatory system believed the very complex derivatives which contributed to the collapse of the financial system would render it uh, immune from such instability. So we need constantly to be aware that banks are unstable, that they're the source of money, that if they are, that instability lead, instability leads to a crash, we lead, it leads to a contraction in the money supply, and uh, that can exacerbate and intensify a recession. I give way to Madam Deputy. And I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I'm listening very carefully. Does that mean that the banks are also uncontrollable? as things stand? No, they can be controlled, they should be controlled. Uh, they're controlled both in being required to have assets and ultimately uh, in the measures government should take to ensure that they don't expand lending too rapidly. And that's the point I want to come on to. Because the other thing that a failure to focus on the nature of banking and the nature of money creation, uh, the other uh, confusion it's caused is uh, a confusion about the causes of inflation and the role of quantitative easing. Because we don't understand, or too many people don't understand where money comes from, there is confusion about quantitative easing. And to some extent, uh, the monetarists, of which I am one, are responsible for this confusion. For most of our lifetimes, the basic economic problem has been inflation. There have been great debates about the causes of inflation. Ultimately, those debates were won by the monetarists. They said inflation is caused by uh, too much money, money growing more rapidly than output. And if that happens, inevitably and inexorably, prices will rise. The trouble was, all too often, monetarists uh, used the shorthand phrase uh, inflation is caused by government printing too much money. In fact, of course, it isn't governments printing the money, it's banks lending money and creating new money at too great a rate uh, for the needs of the economy. Uh, we should have said uh, inflation follows when governments allow or encourage banks to create money too rapidly. The inflationary problem wasn't who created the money, but the fact that too much money was created. We're now in a situation where the banks are not lending enough to create enough money to finance the growth and expansion of the economy we need. And that's why the central bank steps in with quantitative easing. And that is often described as the bank stepping in and printing money. And those who have been brought up to believe that printing money was what caused inflation think that quantitative easing must, by definition, cause inflation. It only causes inflation if there's too much of it. If you create too much money, uh, I'll give you a second, too much money uh, um, at a faster rate than the growth of output and therefore drive up prices. But that isn't the situation in which we find ourselves at present. I'll give way to you. Is making a very good explanation of the different circumstances of the money creation. Uh, when it comes to a situation when there is a demand required, and he's spoken about the morality and he's spoken about quantitative easing, what is his view on the theory of helicopter money uh, and where this money then gets spread? Um, well, I'm rather attractive as a disciple of uh, Milton Friedman, the idea of helicopter money. I think it was he who introduced the metaphor. Uh, that uh, it would be just as effective if the money was sprayed by a helicopter as if it were created by banks. Uh, and uh, 
hopefully, since I live quite near the helicopter route to Bazzi, I will be a principal recipient. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't think there is a mechanism available for us to do that, but I'm not averse to it in principle if someone uh, can come up to it. But all, the point I'm making is that either the banks spontaneously or the banks encouraged by the central bank uh, through quantitative easing must generate enough money to ensure the economy can grow steadily and stably. I give away. Given where it isn't a form of helicopter money, it could be argued that increasing welfare payments, because the people who are most likely to spend money are the people with very little money, and the economic multiplier of putting money in the pockets of those who have little money actually is very positive as it gets spent and it circulates very quickly. Uh, well, I think there are far better reasons to give money to poor people than the idea that their money will then circulate more rapidly. Actually, there's no evidence for that. I invite the Honourable Member to read Milton Friedman's theory of the consumption function, which showed that that's all nonsense. Uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, there, are, there are good reasons for giving money to poor people, namely that they're poor and they need money. Uh, and it, whether, whether or not the money should be injected by the government spending more than it's raising... Uh, rather than the uh, central bank expanding its balance sheet is a moot point. But all I want to argue today is that we should recognise that uh, the economy is as much threatened by a shortage of money as by an excess of money. For most of our lifetimes, the problem has been an excess of money. Now it's a shortage of money. Uh, and we therefore need to balance in either occasion the rate of growth of money with the rate of growth of output if we are to have stability of prices and stable economic activity. And I congratulate my honourable friend again on bringing to the attention of the House these very important matters. Austin Mitchell.